Hey everyone, it's Dr. Robinson. I am going to go over chapter four of um, your text, and this is um, the etiology of addiction. Um, you notice I say addiction, not substance abuse, even though that's what your book says, because I believe that this is the etiology of all addictions, not just chemical addictions. Um, so I think that's important, like we discussed or like I discussed early on, to use proper terminology. Um, so there are several things that I want you to be aware of when you're reading this chapter. Um, you know, you're going to go over a couple of, of theories that explain or attempt to explain some better than others, uh, you know, why people use, why people continue to use, um, how addiction develops, uh, etc. The first one um, is moral theory, and I'm just going to off the bat just say that, um, you know, this um, places a lot of judgment and stigma and blame on the individual who has an addictive use disorder. Um, it's it's pretty archaic in its thinking, um, uh, and it and it's it centers around choice and willpower. So individuals are choosing to engage in, in, in unhealthy behaviors, and they they don't have the willpower to stop. They lack the, the willpower, and just um, you know, your book sort of mentions just generally morally corrupt. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly pathologizing um, the individual, pathologizing, um, uh, you, you know, making making the individual just seem like a really bad bad person. Uh, unfortunately, um, some of these sort of aspects of moral theory do uh, exist today. Uh, a lot of that happens, um, you know, because uh, we rely on the criminal justice system to aid in getting people help or aid in uh, assigning punishment for drug-related crimes. Um, if any of you guys are interested in, in the criminal justice aspect of addictive use disorders, I'd love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, but uh, the criminal justice system um, is trying, uh, try, tries, but in, in some respects perpetuates moral theory. Um, you did wrong. You have consequences. Those consequences um, usually result in jail and very little treatment. Um, consequences are great, but if we're not going to offer anyone treatment, um, then then I'm not sure the benefit. Um, let's see. Uh, so just really, um, you know, again, just, just want to highlight moral theory is not one that fits in with the counseling philosophy. It doesn't fit in with a counseling identity in, in, in assuming that people are just really bad um, or morally ill repute, if you will. Uh, so moral theory, um, not one that we necessarily agree with as a theory, uh, or excuse me, as a practice or a field. Uh, disease theory. So, so disease theory, this is one that is pretty predominant that this is the, the the guiding theory if you will currently uh it it assumes that um you know that 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 addiction is is chronic and that it's a disease and it needs to be treatment needs to be viewed from from that perspective and so um you know it's kind of from this medical model approach uh you know the dsm um speaks to that uh in that it's a, a disease and um you know, more relying on a, on a medical model type of approach. Um, you know, that the, the brain is really um, at the base of this and, and that addiction touches on the reward pathway of the brain or the reward center of the brain. When we, when I have a discussion with you next week about um, substances and the physiology of substances, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reward pathway, so I'm not going to get into that too much right now, um, but the disease theory focuses on neurotransmitters and that very specific or primitive part of our brain called the reward pathway or the reward center. Essentially, this feels good. I want to do it again, regardless of the consequences or the effects. Um, pause that because we will come back to that next week, I promise, and it's a very interesting conversation. Um, Disease theory, what else do I want to highlight on disease theory? Uh, you know, 
disease theory focuses on abstinence. So there's no, there's no way of getting around uh, this concept. Um, disease theory promotes abstinence and abstinence only. Um, that's why AA and 12 step, uh, that's, that's typically their approach. I say typically because um, some folks define their abstinence very differently, but um, uh, predominantly that's the, 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 the focus is, is, is on abstinence. Um, a little negative bit about disease theory is that if you have a disease, then you don't have uh, a level of responsibility. So I have this disease. There's only so much I can do because I have this disease. Um, and and uh, some folks don't necessarily think that that's the healthiest way of looking at addiction, as opposed to being able to take full responsibility um, minimally and ask for help. Um, let's see. Um, genetic theory. Let's jump into genetic theory. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, so the strong, you know, their research exists that certainly does uh, place a huge link uh, or, or contributing factors on genetics. Um, the the dilemma here is sort of a chicken or an egg uh, dilemma or a chicken or an egg conversation. Um, is it purely genetics or is it that your family history and family of origin issues? So if you're a symptom, if you're a, a systems person, uh, this might fall in line with your theory, but um, is it purely genetics or is it that the system that you grew up in or the system that you're a part of um, had its own trials and tribulations and, and upsets and uh, so much so that it caused trauma in your family or caused upset in your upbringing, resulting in that catalyst needed to sort of spark this need for unhealthy coping um, or attachment to something other than a healthy parent, uh, i.e. a substance. Um, so again, if you're a systems person, if you believe, if your theory revolves around the idea that, um, you know, we don't exist outside of our family and, and our system, then, then um, you may not agree with genetic theory. You may agree with the idea that the family does play a role, but it's the family dysfunction that plays a role. Uh, if, if that, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, but it's so it, 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 it uh, genetic says it's, it, it's uh, you know, the genetic factors um, that result in the development of use. Um, let's see. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Uh, it's sort of genetic theory focuses on the idea of like antisocial behavior. So assuming that most folks with addictive use disorders do have some sort of antisocial behavior. I'm careful not to say antisocial personality disorder because that is obviously labeling and, and a diagnosis, but there are aspects according to this theory that are in line with antisocial behavior. Um, um, let's see, uh, addiction, or excuse me, genetics theory views addiction and recovery as this process. So it takes a really long time. Um, relapse occurs because there are molecular changes or um, uh, more familial sort of um, aspects of your chemistry that result in um, uh, dependence, maybe some, some, some relapse behavior. Uh, let's see. Most certainly, you know, and your book states this, but most certainly if you have a parent of someone who does have an addictive use disorder, you are at greater risk of developing an addictive use disorder um, when compared to the general population. So that direct link, a parent, if one of your parents has um, an addictive use disorder, you have a greater greater propensity or greater chance. Again, uh, chicken or an egg, is that because this genetic link or is it because of the um, disruption or dysfunction that may exist because one of your parents has an addictive use disorder? Um, you know, we don't know, and again, theories, uh, theories are theories. 
Um, behavioral theories, we use a lot of behavioral approaches in treatment, but behavioral theory sort of assumes that, that addiction is, is, is learned um, and that it's a function of um, uh, you know, needing to positive reinforcement, um, positive experiences, and wanting to repeat these reinforcers so this feels good i want to do it again this feels good i want to do it again or on the opposite i don't have to feel what's bad so i want to do this again i don't have to feel what's bad i i want to be numb i don't want to think about these things so i'm going to do this again um, and then of course you get dependence and withdraw in there um habit the concept of habit comes into play when we think about uh behavioral theories um just that human beings are habitual in nature. Uh, so you know, if you think of Pavlov and his dogs, um, that's a good explanation for that. Um, the, the recovery is based off of breaking habit and um, rewarding positive behaviors, not rewarding behavior, not perpetuating, um, wanting to reward negative behaviors. Sociocultural theories, um, this is, uh, you know, the, the culture and the environment's impact on addiction. Um, so that, that just use in general varies uh, by culture to, from culture to culture. Um, gender plays a role, race, ethnicity, SES, so socioeconomic status, and then, of course, uh, the um, socialization. So how, how much have you been socialized? What type of socializ socialization? Uh, all those sorts of factors, um, and that you know, there's the 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 pressure to conform or fit in that drives the the want or the need to use, and then the need to maintain that uh, it, it, it keeps it going. You know, folks have a positive experience, and then they just want to continue to do that, so they hang around uh, hang around folks who um use and continue to use and and it's this um cycle if you will um and then again you know different cultures view use very differently so you know even the way we uh in the united states or we traditionally view addiction um isn't necessarily accepted in all cultures currently um but and we'll wrap i'll wrap it up with this um the last uh the last approach um, is an integrated approach and so that's the idea that addiction is just not one dimensional so it's not a moral model it's not just a genetic uh, approach or um, theory it's not the disease theory it's not just one of those theories that etiology um, the etiology of addiction uh, assumes all of these sorts of theories that it's genetics that it's environmental that it's a that it's learned um, maybe not so much moral, hopefully, um, but that it can't be explained with just one theory and that there are two, you know, the, the human existence, human experience, and, and just pain and discomfort in general uh, are way too varied and have too many variables to consider explaining it in just one or through one single theory. Um, so it's biological, genetic, psychological, spiritual, um, you know, folks aren't grounded in things that are meaningful to them. Um, and then of course, sociological factors, uh, that last one. Uh, there's a, you, you know, on your PowerPoints, and I'm kind of going through your PowerPoints in your book as I'm talking to you, but um, um, little graph or this little illustration, if you will, that, uh, you know, has all of these factors here. And, and current research certainly does look at all of these factors. Um, treatment, if if we could go there for a little bit, treatment doesn't necessarily address all of these factors in the most appropriate way. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, um, we're working. We're, we in the field, I think, are working on 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 doing a better job at this. So I'm hopeful that treatment will continue to change. Um, okay, so that's a quick um, down and dirty little rundown of the um, etiology of addiction. You've got, uh, you've got a video that you have to watch. Um, you've got some things that you need to read uh, for your assignments. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, the video is a Gabber Mate video. Um, take the time. 
Watch it. It's fantastic. All right.